I don't know. I guess outside of Patty John's known me just about as long as 44, 45 years. Yeah. Yeah, we both were, buddy. <laughs> we're both we were both thin back then, but uh, Rosh Hashanah, we all understand, was a couple weeks ago. That's the new Jewish New Year, and uh, two days, and it's we kicked off our ten days of prayer with that. But as I was <coughs> studied and I've studied over the years, I've noticed that they do a remarkable thing on their New Years. On their New Years. They, everybody gathers in their family, and they read the Agadah, the account of Abraham taking Isaac up to Mount Moriah, which would later become Solomon's temple. Now, that's what God directed him to do, and how God provided in the midst of a seemingly impossible situation. Now, in the, Jews, in the Jewish life of telling stories, you have Halakha and Agadah. <coughs> Agadah. Agadah is said, it's done to make you inspired, to encourage you. And that's what Jesus spoke when he spoke in parables, to teach, to inspire, to encourage. The halakha was just the facts. Remember that program, just car, dragnet, Sergeant Friday, just the facts. All I want is the facts. Just give me the facts, ma'am, that's all I need. Well, that's the Haggadah. The halakha, the halakha, the agadah, is it meant to inspire, to encourage you. And so the family at every New Year's would sit down and read this, to be inspired, to be encouraged. We got a new year coming. We live in tumultuous times. We have stuff that we may never understand coming down the pike. And I'm talking about us. So the account is to reaffirm, to inspire that no matter what is coming, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who sees, will provide. And that's what I want to look at this morning is because it, it, we're coming on to a, a very tumultuous time in our nation. We're coming to a time of, of one way or another, almost a split in the road as it seems. I want us to stay focused and stay obedient on the Lord God. I want us to make sure that even though we seem to be facing tough times, the Jewish family would, would get around and they would read this account of how God called and, and God and Isaac, just Abraham and Isaac would go and, and then God provided. That's where we get the, the story, it's where we get Jehovah Jireh, the word, the name of God for. So with your indulgence, I'm just going to read part of Genesis 22. Now, when it came to pass, these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Notice that in this reading, all three times that Abraham is addressed to by God, it's always, here am I. It's not what he want. You ever have your kids, they, they, you yell, what do you want? Yeah, not, not, not my kids never did it more than once. <laughs> but what do you want? Oh, I can't tell you. Hey, guys, how many of you have ever taken a list, wrote out some things, and given it to your wife and say, honey, I'd like you to get all this stuff done? <laughs> No, 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 you laugh, you laugh because how many, of us, how many of us have ever gotten a list that said, here's your list of honeydews? I don't know why. See, that's how my brain works sometimes. It's just off kilter, just a bit. Someone, John, would say a lot more than a bit. But I want to, I want to, I want to vote his word, his, his, his righteousness, trust in the outcome. Psalm 1633, for the guys that are taking the class, the lot is cast, but in every, de every decision is from the Lord. We can vote, and we should, but the decisions have already been made by God. And so Abraham, God tested Abraham, 
And he said to Abraham, and, he, and Abraham said back, here am I. Here I am. And he said, take your son. This, I don't know, we've all read this. We've all read this numerous, numerous times. And four or five people in here preached on it. But it, it's almost mean. Take your only son. Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. I mean, I don't know about you, but that seems like, whoa, God, you gave me this son. Sarah was over 90. And go to the land of Moriah Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and he saddled his donkey and he took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. He arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. We will come back to you. Man, that's a man of faith. He knows what God's called him to. He knows God's told him, I I want you to slit your son's throat. That's the offering on the sacrifice. But we're going to come back. I don't think he just knew I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to say, yes, Lord, and I'm going to do what he tells me to do, and everything else is up to him. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the heat of it in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and he said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. And then he said, look, we got fire, we got wood. You built a pretty classy altar here. Uh, Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac. Isaac is anywhere from 12 to 14, maybe a little older, I don't know. I think that's a general concept of how he old. That's a pretty trusting kid, pretty obedient kid. Now, because the, we are reading this and we're doing it akada, akada, we're going to fill in a little bit. Halakha, just give me the facts. Akada fills in. On the other side of the mountain, there is a goat, a ram, just minding his own business. Minding his own business. Having a good life. No problems. And he hears a little nudge. <clears throat> I need you to go up the top of that mountain. Man, what? I said, lift up your head and go up that mountain. <laughs> it's good down here, man. I said, get up the mountain. Okay. So he gets up the mountain. And then the voice says, I want you to stick your head in that thicket over there. <laughs> what? I said, stick your head in that thicket over there. Okay. See, God saw and will provide. Before they ever got the altar built, before they ever got it done, God had a ram stick his head in the thicket and get caught. So what you're facing, what you're facing, what we're going to be facing, God already knows what's going on. God's already started the supply chain. He's already supplied, started supplying all that you need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. He's already started that. Now, back to, well, the ram's in the thicket. He's stuck there. And they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and placed the wood in order uh, that he, he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him upon the altar upon the wood, and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, again he says, here am I. 
dream on. Not, what are you doing? What's going on? Quit bothering me. I'm doing what you told me to do. Will you give me a break? Lord, I'm doing the best I can. What do you keep bothering me for? So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Everybody knows this is the typology of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world, that whosoever should believe upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, we love that verse. Now, let's remember the second 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We need to quit condemning people in the world. We need to confusing and pointing and everything else because we're driving them away from faith, not driving them towards it, not bringing them towards us. No, we're in the know of them, just letting it happen. Then you have not withheld. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Here's the thing. Then the promises, you know, the generations, the kids, the sands of the season, and the blessings follow. We need to step out in faith once in a while, believing God's going to do what he said he's going to do. No matter what happens, we need to stay focused and obedient to God. A life of faith does not promise a life that is safe or even secure, nor does it guarantee a rich and easy life. Like Abraham and Isaac, faith requires risk. Amen? It requires risk. Are we going to stand and be faithful? Are we going to stand and do what the Word of God says? Are we going to be obedient to what the Word of God said? Are the principles within the Word going to be the principles that we live our life by? Are the morals within the Word going to be the morals that we're going to live our life by? Or are we just going to pick and choose? If we want to be blessed, if we want to live a life of faith and joy and God's intervening and providing Jehovah Jireh. We need to be a people who make a decision. I will be obedient to the Lord. Even when it's not the right thing. I told you some time ago, I, when, I, when I accepted the Lord, rededicated my life, I guess, um, my best friend came and said, hey, man, what'd you do? I said, man, I'm living for God now. I just, you know, accepted Christ. I, I didn't give him any sermon. He says, we'd we done everything. We'd been to Mexico together. We'd traveled together. We'd done all kinds of stuff together. And uh, he said, if you stay a Christian, we're no longer friends. Hasn't talked to me in almost 50 years. Parents, I still talk to his parents. You're going to get labeled sometimes when you're going to live for the Lord. That's okay. You may lose a few friends. I still consider him a friend. He may not from me, but, you know, a couple of weeks from now, I'll wish him a happy birthday. But uh, you may even get labeled. My goodness, none of you have ever gotten labeled, have you? And all these words, where was I the other day? Where was I? I was someplace, and somebody called me a misogynist. And I looked at him, and I went, wait, 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 time out, time out, time out. I've been married for 51 years to the same woman. My mother-in-law, who's the best mother-in-law that ever walked the earth, lived with us. I've got five daughters, fearfully and wonderfully made. I've got nine granddaughters and another granddaughter coming. I've got three great-granddaughters. And you're saying I, I hate women? What, am I getting punished for something? What's going on? <laughs> and and I, I think it's so often people throw around the labels. Look, I'm just going to follow the Lord. You do what you want to do, but I'm going to follow Jesus. If I get a label, I get a label. You know? But it doesn't mean, remember what we talked about a few weeks ago. Just because they label you, just because they're not walking with the Lord. Paul says, don't make them your enemy. Don't make them your enemy. Continue to treat them 
well. Faith requires risk. It pushes us to follow God into a life of adventure. That's what this whole life is called to. We get, Linda, what a great testimony. Talking to people, talk about it. Christmas child, you realize we're going to send more boxes, almost twice as many boxes as we've ever sent before. And you realize as we go, God is providing for somebody else in a way that is seemingly impossible. We've had them come here to talk. Kids who got their only gift, their only time they ever got a gift was a Christmas shoebox. They were in refugee camps. We, we, we know them. And then they accepted Jesus. 900 and some boxes out there, is that what we have? 910. And every box is going to a child. And they're going to know about Jesus, and they're going to know about you. A lot of those boxes are going to places where they don't say Christmas child on the outside. They can't. They're going to places where the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is not welcome. But they're going to be taken in boxes of toys, gifts for kids. God is going to provide through you through you, salvation. You aren't going to be the salvation, but you're going to be the bearer of the news. You're going to be the gift that's going to delight their hearts and their lives. That's quite something. But God's going to use us as we do it. I believe if we don't risk our safety and security, we don't step out in faith, I'm not sure we'll ever know what God really wants to experience for us. I think God is ready to do the seemingly impossible, the practically improbable, and he is always dependable for provision. If Abraham had not trusted God, if he had not risked everything, obeyed following God's instructions, he would not have discovered God's provisions and blessings. We live in a time we need to listen to God's calling. Be obedient to his direction and rest assured God will provide. Amen? It's amazing in our lives if we'll just listen to God, watch what he's doing, be obedient to his word and his calling, his direction. How many times we're blessed, but not just us. It's not just us that are getting blessed. Other people are being blessed because somebody has to be the ram going up the hill on the other side. Somebody has to be the one that God is saying, I want you to go here. You and I, I want you to go there. I want you to be involved in Christmas Child. I want you to be one that encourages others to do so hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children can come, come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And plus the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they get a gift. First thing is that I believe God will provide when it's seemingly impossible. When he, it just doesn't make any sense at all. It's seemingly impossible. And they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar, placed the wood on the altar, and he bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood, stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. Abraham or Abraham. Hold your hand. This is a test. This is only a test. How many times has God had us move in a direction and we were just, okay, God, you're going to have to do it. And if we do it, we receive the blessing. We receive the joy. I, I, more than that, I want to tell you, we receive an experience. Every time we step out, every time we walk in faith, Every time we move in a place where God says, do this, it's uncomfortable, it's tough to do, um, we do it anyway. It's not just the blessing or the blessing we get to give to somebody else or something else. We get the experience of knowing that our God is faithful. We get the experience of knowing no matter what happens, he's already provided, he's already in front of us, he's already taken care of us through it. 
We will never experience a robust relationship with God until we begin to step out in faith. And I think it's time for some of us to step back in boldly into faith. I think it's time for some of us just to, to lovingly step back in and say, Lord, I've sort of scooted, I've been on ice. How many of you have cruise control in your car? I just got on the highway of life. Jesus loves me. I love Jesus. Hit retirement, so I'm going to put it on reti- put it on cruise control. God doesn't want any Christians cruising into heaven on cruise control. He wants us listening, obedient, and moving, moving faster if we need to go faster, slower if we need to go slower, because he's directing us wherever we go. And we will not know the joy, I don't believe, of experiencing God's robust adventure for our life until we begin to step out. And some of us need to step in a little bit more robustly. All too many believers would rather have a life of safety and control than a vibrant life courageously living and following Jesus. Listen to this. When our need for security becomes obsessive. We remove ourselves from the journey of discipleship. When I have to be secure and safe and warm and and I don't have to worry about being fat on that already. But but when our when we have to just we don't want any troubles, we want everything smooth. We God's called us to a journey that has troubles in it. But he is greater than all our troubles. He's greater than that. But if we opt just for security, when that becomes our obsessive thing, we remove ourselves from the journey of discipleship. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible for God. I encourage you this morning, begin to thank God for that thing, that area that seems most imp- impossible, seemingly impossible, begin to thank him, Lord, you have an answer for this. You have an answer for this. Lord, you have an answer for this. I'm going to begin to thank you now, Lord. You're more than able. I thank you, Lord. I'm going to begin to pray into that. I'm going to begin to speak into that in the name of Jesus. I'm going to begin not to just whine and roll around and woe is me. I'm going into the yard and I'm going to dig dirt and eat worms. God's calling for a people who will begin to thank him and praise him. He delights in doing the impossible. For nothing is impossible for God. Begin to thank God for those things that seem impossible and watch Jehovah Jireh, our God who sees and provides, and he will. I think another thing that God wants us to understand is that There are times the answer comes practically improbable. It's just just weird. This is is one of the strangest stories in the New Testament. I'm sorry. I just think it's one of the strangest. Matthew 17. We all know the story. And if you've been to Jerusalem, you've been to Capernaum, you know know where the house is at, you know what's going on. Matthew 17, 24 to 27. And their arrival in Capernaum, The collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. And then he went into the house. When you go into Capernaum, they found a house, and in the rubble down below, about uh, below, they found a, a, a thing that said, Cephas' house, Peter's house. It's about a block from the temple, and the house is, is about a block and a half from the Sea of Galilee. So he leaves the temple. He goes home. Jesus is there. And he went to the house. Before he even had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? Well, they tax the people they've conquered, Peter replied. Well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. 
However, we don't want to offend them. So go down to the lake, throw in a line, and open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you'll find a large silver coin. Take it and go pay the temple tax for both of us. Is that improbable or what? How many of you have ever opened a fish's mouth and found a silver coin? How many? I haven't. I have opened a fish's mouth when I was gutting the halibut, and inside was a cod. And inside the cod was a little eel. About that long. And the eel had taken the bait on the skate. So the eel comes by, takes the bait on the J hook, the, uh, the halibut hook, gets stuck. The cod comes along and goes, whoa, buffet. And he's about four pounds, so he grabs that little thing, swallows him. Halibut, 200 and some, 300 pounds, comes along and goes, whoa, yeah, that looks good. Boop, swallowed him. Now, I've seen all that, and you know, we, my brother was a teacher, so when we found that in Glacier Bay, we, he turned on all the deck lights and cut it open, and he laid them all out so we could show them back to his class. I'm going, let's just get back to fishing. Forget your kids. But he tells Peter, go down, go down to the sea, throw in a line, the first fish you catch. He didn't say the seventh fish. He didn't say the 27th fish. He didn't say the 97th fish. He said the first fish you catch, you're going to find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the back. God is always going to do ways that we don't think are possible. Improbable. God is going to provide in improbable ways, not just how we expect it. So be ready for that. Philippians 4, 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, I told you that in our first church in Corning, we were so cute. I should have brought that picture. Gorgeous, drop-dead gorgeous wife. Four gorgeous little girls. Curly-headed, all blonde. I mean, and then they got me. But anyway, um, and we went there thinking, oh, man, this is going to be really cool. I mean, who's not going to love us? See, the problem, we went into ministry thinking people wanted us. We went into ministry thinking, oh, boy, are we going to have, this is wonderful. This is what we're called to do. We gave up my careers. We gave up this. We, gave, we sold the house. We're, we're, we're going for God. What did they say they didn't want? They told the district supervisor, we don't want a young person out of college, fresh out of college. We do not want one with young kids, and we do not want one. What was the third one? That's here, I wrote down. No pastor with children, no young pastor, no pastor fresh out of Bible college. A couple weeks out of Bible college, here we come rolling up. Word got around, okay, we're going to starve them out. We're going to starve them out. Now, I didn't know this. District supervisor knew this. And later when I called him on it, he goes, well, I'm just testing you. And you know who it was, and so do you. <laughs> no, 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 that's Hammond on, in the book of Esther. <laughs> but we were so shocked. But we didn't know anything, so we're fat and happy and beautiful little family. We've got a nice home, swimming pool, everything else. And, uh, but we were living on our savings. I hadn't got a job yet. And uh, trying to fix up the job, blah, 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 blah. And the guy comes in, probably my second week, third week there, and he gives me the most woeful tale of destitute that you've ever heard. And his wife attended the church occasionally. And oh, they were destitute without food and without blah, 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 blah. And I thought, oh. and I reached my wallet. I had 20 bucks. That's it. We were living on savings. That was 20 bucks. 20 bucks in that day bought you a grocery cart full of groceries. So for four little girls, that was a grocery cart of food. I didn't uh, drive the car because I couldn't afford the gas. Gas was, oh, 
89 cents a gallon. And I couldn't, I couldn't afford the gas, so I always rode my bicycle to and from. And so I gave him the 20 bucks thinking, okay, okay, it's going to be all right. I mean, he, he probably needs it more than me. So a few hours later, I get on my bicycle, I start riding home, and I go by one of the bars in town, and right outside the bar, in the alley right there, this guy is puking up my 20 bucks. I did not have enough. I was too scared to tell Patty. <laughs> she didn't know what I did with the last 20 bucks. And I remember praying, God, why? This doesn't seem right. I did that thinking I was doing right. And so I got on my bicycle the next morning, about 5 o'clock, to ride back to church. And in Corning, on the street there, they have a, a Grange Hall, um, and they play bingo on Friday and Saturday nights. Beautiful summer morning. And I'm pedaling by the Grange Hall, and I look down. What's that in the gutter? So I stopped my bike, get off, picked up a roll of bills, $67. I looked around, got on my bicycle, and kept pedaling. <laughs> It was six, it was five in the morning, whatever it was, there was nobody around. But it's amazing how God will provide in some of the most whacked out ways, improbable ways we never thought. It's it just one of those things we begin to, to understand that he sees. And when I believe when we walk in faith, when we do what we feel God's called us to do. And by the way, I got a clue for you. Once in a while, you're going to blow it. I blew it. I don't know if I'd have found the $67 the next morning if I hadn't given it to him. But I know I did what I felt was right. I felt this is a principle. This, this family's destitute. I need to do what I can. In hindsight, I should have figured it out since I'd never seen him at church before. <laughs> and he only told me his wife came to his church. I might have, he might have figured out there's a new pastor in town. Green as grass. God provides so often, practically in improbable ways. Just stay obedient to God, and I believe he will provide. And it will come sometimes in most improbable ways. Amen? Third, God is always dependable. For I know what I have planned. Nahashaved. Plural, absolute, past tense. It's not what I have, I'm planning. It's not that I'm moving this and moving that. It's what I have planned. It's absolute. If it was in Greek, we'd saw it's an imperative mood, but it's in Hebrew. It means absolute. God's got plans for you and my lives, and if we'll live for him, be obedient for, to him, even when it seems strange, he's going to provide. He's going to find a way. For I know what I have planned. Plural, past tense, absolute. For you, says the Lord, I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a future filled with hope. Amen? We need to begin to thank God for that. We need to take that step out once in a while and say, Lord, I thank you. I may be going through stuff. I'm trying to find a decent word. I may be going through a lot of hard stuff right now, but I know, Lord, you've got something in the midst of all this plan. I know that you're working on it. Lord, you've called each one in this room who knows you as a Lord and a Savior, who's committed to following you, to give them a future filled with hope. Amen? Oh, i got to stop there. I remember one time we had a kid in, in uh, Bible college, and we would preach, and they would practice preach. And in the 20 minutes he preached, I think it was 62 or 63 times he said, you know. <laughs> and they'd always mark you down for that. So I'm not going to say amen much more. Ephesians 
We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things, accomplish which he planned for us ages ago. Ages ago. We were hid in Christ before the foundations of the world. Do you think he's going to do all that and just let you bump through life? No. If we'll turn our hearts to him, turn our homes to him, turn everything to him, Lord, we want to be obedient to your word and to your will, to your principles, to your morals, to everything else, Lord. I believe you have plans for us to accomplish, not just struggle, but accomplish. He was 13. Let your covenant be, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never, never leave you. I will never, never, never forsake you. Double and triple imperative, and Jesus did not have a speech impediment. Said for effect, I will not leave you. I have plans for your life, for a hope and a future. I know what's coming down the pike. Hang on to me, and we're going to get through this. We're going to accomplish that, which I have planned for your life to accomplish, for you to bless others, for you to be a blessing to others, for you to be blessed before the foundation of the world, earth was set. Isaiah 49, 15. Never. I cannot, never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I will never forget you. That's our God speaking to us. No matter what the future holds, remember that our God is Jehovah Jireh. He sees and provides. He sees and provides. He's called us to a life of redemption. He's called us to a life of being a part of what he wants to accomplish on this earth. It isn't just about you, it isn't just about me. It's about who God has put us in contact with, who we're around, so that we can bless and we can touch, so that we can send 910 as of today. I think we'll have 1,000 by the time we get to the end of our count. That's 1,000 children getting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's 1,000. By the way, by the way, according to the, Bill, the Franklin Graham statistics, Every child gets a box, gets saved. It doesn't mean that child gets saved. A child might not have got a box. They'll get part of it, and they'll get saved. And as for you who go down to battle, and as for you who stay behind and supply and, and take care, the reward will be the same forever. And this is to be a statue forever and ever. When you fill a box... When you reach and bless, when you touch in the name of Jesus, and when that goes overseas, that goes to a country that doesn't allow the gospel to get into, but the boxes get in because they're toys for kids. In those boxes is the good news of Jesus Christ. In the boxes is hope and salvation through Jesus Christ. Every time you seal one of those boxes and we pray over them and send them out, we're, and I, don't, don't take this wrong, we're getting credit just as much as the people on the front line. Just as much as Karen Grubbs. She went over there about 15, 12 years ago now. Just God called her. Went over there as a missionary. God began to work and bless. You know, by the way, how many of you know how Karen Grubbs' story goes? She waited until her husband died. And when he died, she said, okay. Lord, what do you want me to do now? It was a long and a painful thing for her. But she knew she loved children. She knew that she loved to teach. She was part of the Sunday school program. And off she went. They have, they, she was given 40 acres, you know that? They have a school, an orphanage. They have everything. We're one of the major suppliers for what goes on in there. I Praise God for the fact that we ran across each other at one time. What a joy it is to be a participant in that. House of Grace, is that the, Wanda, what, is that the name? Saving Grace. Got three new girls, two or three. 
three girls, but I know they got a couple in the air. Here's why. They get to learn about Jesus. They get taught. If need, they get their GEDs. Whole life in Jesus Christ. Whole life. Never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. Commit your ways to the Lord. Psalms 37, 5. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will act. That's Jehovah Jireh. That's a God who sees and acts. He's called us to a life of adventure, a life of challenge, a life of experience. I was talking to somebody the other day. Oh, I know it was. And uh, they had gone through a a great challenge. By the way, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you prayed for Lindsay, who was uh, a friend, uh, a dear friend's daughter. Uh, she's probably in her 30s now, isn't now, 40s. Patty hooked them up together when we were in Bible college, Mark Regulus. She baked him a pay, cake if you take, Bar no, pie. He's baking pie if you take Barbie out. And uh, we all went to Disneyland. And as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> but I, I think he led with baptism in the Holy Spirit, too. And uh, their daughter had a massive hemorrhage in her brain, had to be airlifted. And uh, we prayed. I know some of you prayed. Thank you. Because they fought, they found it, and quickly. What they thought originally was going to be life-altering and changing, if not life-finishing, turned to be just a leak. And they took care of it very quickly. And we were talking about the fact, well, you know, Mark. And we were talking about the fact that in school, we used to have a professor that would always say, the person, the man with the experience is never at the mercy of the person with the argument. And I remember thinking, and, and I got that texted back to me, the smiles. You can't tell me our God doesn't heal. You can't tell me my God doesn't provide. You can't tell me my God doesn't do mighty and powerful things as we follow him, dedicate to him. If you want to know the adventures of following God, if you want to know the thrill, the Blues Brothers went on a mission for God. We're on a mission with God. Maybe I shouldn't have made that movie reference. But it was a great movie. I want to tell you, I don't know where you're at this morning, but I prepared, as I was working over this this week, I was thinking, Lord, I, I just feel a real compulsion that, that some of us need to just say, Lord, I, I'm, I, I want to kick it back out of cruise control. I want, I want to get that re-anointed, that re-feeling. That doesn't mean you get to run up and cluck like a chicken and run around. What it does mean, Lord, I want to be renewed and refreshed, refilled. Lord, I, I want to kick my life out of cruise control, and I want to get back to trusting you. I want to get back to being obedient, which you called me to do. Amen? And, and uh, here's, here's the tough thing with, with that kind of a statement, is because the minute I say I, I want to pray for some this morning who really want to get a re recharge, re you're just kicking it out of cruise control. You acknowledge that life or time has gone on cruise control, and you still love them. You never not stop, stop loving God. You just went on cruise control. And you're saying, okay, God, I want to step back into the game. I want to get off the bench and back into the game. You've always been a part of the team. But now you're saying, I want to get back onto the field. You see? And I, 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 only you know what that means. Only you. I do not know what that means for anybody but me. But I knew, do know that some of us need to kick it out of cruise control. And we're going to have a couple of teams. Who's our prayer team this morning? Gary and Nancy. Okay. Um, Pastor Phil, would you also take another team? Uh, you and Miller, Pastor Miller. And, uh, and if we get more, then we'll have more. John brought 
anointing oil by this week, so we got fresh anointing oil. So I just want to encourage you. I know that God has called you, and I know he's doing great things in your life. But let's say, Lord, thank you. What's coming up next? And whatever it is, I say yes, Lord. Yes. Whatever it is, Lord, wherever you're taking me, whatever you're doing, I say yes, Lord. Amen? And on Pastor's Appreciation Sunday, I have never, ever, ever, ever pastored a church that loved us more than this one does. Southside and this one just have been absolutely, unbelievably ingratiating and loving. It, it, it is amazing. Part of that is because I've gotten older and I'm not such a jerk. Don't need to hear a word, John. <laughs> because it's a joy to pastor. It's got its moments. But it wouldn't be adventure if it didn't, would it? Would your wife, would your walk with Jesus be an adventure if you didn't have a little uphill every now and then? Our God is more than able. And I don't know what you're facing today, but I do know, I do know, he wants you to kick it out of your good place. And say, okay, let's kick it up another notch. Let's see where God's... And just be open. Lord, I don't know what's coming up, but I do know you got something good because he said he wanted to call us to adventure. Not me. He did. So I bless you in the name of Jesus. Oh. We had so many of you repeat that we couldn't see the name. <laughs> but... Uh, Oh, yes? Okay. Carl, how do I do this? All as you're comfortable.